After finding out my wife had called me a expletive and was pregnant by another man, I left her with nothing. I'm 33, and she's 27. We married just six months ago after dating for a year. We met online, and our relationship quickly became serious, leading to marriage. I'm a bit of a nerd, and when an attractive woman who said she loved me showed interest, I was completely smitten. I was willing to do anything for her, and she knew it. I own a small business that demands a lot of travel, so I'm rarely home during the week. I was earning $150,000 a year before taxes, and she wasn't working, relying solely on me. She was somewhat lazy, but I didn't think much of it because I allowed it to happen. She didn't do household chores like cooking or cleaning, but I didn't see it as unusual. A few months into our marriage, she announced she was pregnant. I was out of town at the time, so I rushed home. The next day, I took her to a clinic where they confirmed she was two months pregnant. A week later, I came home to grab something for work and noticed her car in the garage, indicating she was home. As I opened the door, I heard noises from the bedroom. I had a sinking feeling about what I was about to find. The door was wide open, and I walked in to find her in bed with another man. Her first words were that it wasn't what it seemed. She was two months pregnant at the time. Seeing her with another man in her bedroom was indescribably painful. I had been preparing to become a father and had centered my world around her, making sure she was comfortable. Yet, there she was, being unfaithful in our own home. It was a moment that revealed her true character. They looked at me in shock as I turned and left the room. She tried to deny what I had clearly seen, as if I was a fool. I pulled myself together, grabbed what I needed, and left. I told her she should be gone by the time I returned. On the drive back to work, I was a mess, unable to focus, and was lucky not to have an accident. I kept replaying all the times she claimed to love me, realizing now it was all a lie. I was completely unaware of her deceit, partly because my job kept me away during the week. She had played her part so well that I never suspected anything. Her plan was to have me support her through her pregnancy and then raise another man's child. She bombarded me with calls and voicemails but I didn't respond once I reached the office. I called a friend, who came over after a couple of hours and told me she had left, taking her essentials. I went to Home Depot to change the locks on the house. Later, I found out she was staying with her family, so I contacted my lawyer and served her with divorce papers. My lawyer advised me to remain silent and not to engage with her family or friends about the divorce. He suggested being polite if I spoke to mutual friends but to let him handle any related conversations. It was good advice, as it helped avoid potential complications or provocations. We coordinated through text messages for her to retrieve her remaining belongings during the following weekend. My friend acted as my representative while she collected the rest of her things. In response, she retaliated by hiring a divorce lawyer and requesting $2,000 per month in alimony for five years. She argued that the pregnancy was mine and that she needed financial support. She also wanted to remain on my health insurance, which I found unreasonable. Despite her alimony demands, I chose not to react with anger. It was a good thing it went through my attorney first, as he informed me that although she may have expected certain things, it wasn't going to happen. While I didn't mind sharing assets acquired during our marriage, my primary goal was to have her out of my life. However, I wasn't willing to reward her with monthly payments for five years for her misbehavior, continue covering her health insurance, and raise a child that clearly wasn't mine. There was no way she could seek support from the guys she had been involved with. When I discussed with my attorney how to navigate around the alimony and other obligations I wasn't eager to fulfill, we considered her lack of employment. I was earning $150,000 a year before taxes, and she depended entirely on me for her financial well-being. Our ultimate goal was to have the alimony completely eliminated, which we managed to achieve. However, his concern was that if we couldn't get it eliminated, we should aim to significantly reduce it due to her actions. Even though it wasn't explicitly written, we could support our case with statistical evidence. He pointed out that in many cases, the courts tend to favor women, 
and there was a risk that her attorney might try to portray me as an enabler and shift blame onto me for her infidelity. It didn't take into account that I had been working this job for over three years and we had been together for almost a year before the cheating occurred. The only minor difference might have been that I worked an hour or so less during that period, but it still amounted to a significant workload, typically 60 to 80 hours a week. It's even more now, six plus years later. If I hadn't caught her, she might have Biko. Me even more dependent on me today. That's why my attorney advised a strong approach, which in hindsight might have been overkill. However, I trusted his expertise given his experience in such matters. He wasn't infallible himself, so he understood the situation well. My attorney was searching for evidence of my wife's infidelity to strengthen my case in the divorce proceedings. He suggested that I hire a private investigator to gather more evidence that could be used in court. My attorney arranged for the investigator to work on my behalf, although I paid the investigator directly. To say that he did an excellent job would be an understatement, he performed exceptionally well. I hope I never have to face him on the opposing side in such a situation. I should note that he also checked up on me, not as extensively as he did on her, but just to ensure, for the attorney's sake, that I wasn't contributing to the issues. Otherwise, I might have been financially supporting her for a few years. Typically. Around 5, UT it could even continue until she remarried, although these days that's quite rare. I suppose having a job like mine doesn't help. Not long after hiring the private investigator, he captured evidence of her spending time with the same guy I had caught her with. I made a mistake by not cancelling my credit card, to which she had access. Consequently, she went out with her lover that evening and racked up a bill of about $5,000. These weren't high-limit cards, I had obtained them mainly to improve my credit score. Since I had been on a cash-only basis for a while, I had forgotten about them. A month later, the private investigator uncovered that she had been cheating throughout our marriage and even before that. He identified two guys she had been involved with but had subsequently ended things with. Both of them agreed to provide affidavits to my attorney. Additionally, the private investigator collected a significant amount of photographic evidence. Based on the testimonies of the affair partners, we realized that my demanding 60 to 80 hour workweeks played right into her plans. She avoided infidelity on the weekends, and her boyfriend was well aware of it. Her actions were carefully calculated. When the private investigator spoke with the two individuals who had gotten fed up enough to provide statements, they were quite candid about it. They emphasized that you didn't reach out to her unless she initiated contact, and so on. The private investigator was the key to my salvation. He managed to track down people she had previously dated, and two of them were angry enough to sign affidavits stating that she had cheated on me and knowingly taken steps to keep me in the dark. I believe alimony can be justifiable in certain situations, such as when one spouse significantly outearns the other or when one spouse has been out of the workforce for an extended period due to the marriage. In such cases, re entering the job market can be challenging due to extended gaps in employment, making financial support reasonable for the duration of the marriage. However, in my case, she was the one who cheated, and I wasn't about to reward her for her deceitful behavior that led to our separation. The private investigator took pictures of her spending time with various men, mostly as evidence of her behavior. While not strictly necessary, they were part of the process. By speaking with some of these men, he traced back to two individuals who felt scorned by her because she had ended their relationships. These two played a crucial role in influencing the judge's decision. They not only confirmed that they had been involved with her while we were married, one had even been with her before our wedding, but they also attested to her deception tactics, such as not calling during weekends when I was home, never coming to the house, and insisting that I not call her until she contacted me, among other things. I asked her to leave. The private investigator discovered that she had gone to a club and was spending time with about 10 men in a back room. This would have been around three months into her pregnancy. I had zero contact with her from the moment I caught her until our court date, although I did receive calls from my family. 
I should mention that her calls kept coming, and about a month after the divorce was finalized, my ex-father-in-law reached out. He accused me of ruining his daughter's life, and I allowed him to vent before offering to have my attorney send him a copy of the data collected by the private investigator. She, of course, painted me as the one who had been unfaithful, even claiming that I was the one she had caught in bed with one of her female friends. He reluctantly agreed. My lawyer reviewed the data with the names of the men withheld, and he called me back about two weeks later. He apologized for yelling at me, and all contact from her family finally ceased. In essence, it was the private investigator who uncovered everything through his research, while the attorney organized the evidence for the legal proceedings. According to my attorney at the time, the court typically tends to favor women, especially in cases involving children, which I couldn't have. So I consider myself fortunate to have avoided a more complex situation. However, my lawyer cautioned that we needed to provide irrefutable proof that she was the cause of our divorce to reduce or eliminate the financial obligations. With the assistance of the private investigator and a few individuals she had angered along the way, we were able to do just that. I still crack lawyer jokes from time to time, but honestly, they are worth every penny and then some. As for private investigators, I'll never make fun of the really good ones. He uncovered information I had never been aware of. During the divorce, I didn't seek reimbursement for her running up my credit cards. I was earning a good income of around $150,000 before taxes at the time, which has since increased to $250,000 before taxes a year. I decided to pay off those credit card charges and considered it a costly mistake since I hadn't canceled them, making me legally responsible for the expenses. Pursuing her for the money would have been futile, I wouldn't have recovered anything. Essentially, I just wanted to put it all behind me. That's why I allowed her to take her belongings, most of the items we acquired together, as well as the gifts I had given her. I wanted her out of my life and the reminders of our marriage out of my house, among other things. The only thing I absolutely didn't want to do was pay her $2,000 a month for approximately five years, which my attorney said was the typical outcome. I also didn't want any involvement with her unborn child. I felt it would be an insult to me and a way of rewarding and condoning her behavior, essentially funding it further for the duration of the payments as for the other costs. I was willing to bear the costs in exchange for a swift resolution and her removal from my life. I believe she was playing some sort of game, and I considered this expense a means to ensure that I met the required time frame. At the time of the divorce, it took six months and one day to complete the entire process in California, now it's something like six weeks if there's no contest. Surprisingly, my divorce was emotionally taxing, and I don't share this to seek sympathy. Instead, I hope that my story might help someone else learn from it or recognize signs that I missed. Looking back, I sometimes wonder if there were subtle hints I didn't pick up on due to my blindness at the time. I still analyzed the situation, but I didn't want to engage in a drawn-out battle. In total, the attorney's fees amounted to about $112,000, roughly equivalent to six months' worth of alimony payments. The attorney informed me that I would likely have to make monthly payments to her for about five years. So I saved a substantial amount of money on that for sure it could have potentially extended even longer depending on the judge's decision. She didn't end up receiving the $2,000 per month once the judge heard all the details during the final divorce hearing. Since the divorce was finalized, I haven't encountered her again, but I'm aware that she's in Arizona because she attempted to apply for credit in my name there three times. I can't be certain if she chose to proceed with the pregnancy, but I'm highly confident that the child wasn't mine. It's likely that she was trying to deceive me into raising another man's child. I acknowledge that I was manipulated and I take responsibility for my part in it every day. She has to live with the consequences of her actions, which likely makes it more difficult for her. Even though she doesn't know me anymore, she may be aware that she had a good thing at one point, but her actions led to her downfall. Whenever we HD the chance. It may sound immature to some but it reflected how much we cherished each other. I was genuinely happy in our marriage and believed that Maddie was too. Now let me explain how I discovered the affair. 
Did I stumble upon a suggestive email or text exchange between her and her lover? No. Did I catch them in the act? No. I actually found out through the ex-girlfriend of her lover, whom I'll refer to as Sarah. Sarah contacted me on LinkedIn and sent me a message asking if we could talk. When we spoke, I initially couldn't comprehend the information she was sharing and thought it might be some sort of prank that Maddie was playing on me. My world was shattered when Sarah sent me a series of pictures and a video showing Maddie engaged in intimate acts with another man. It was a painful reality that I couldn't escape. Witnessing Maddie involved in such intimate moments with a stranger deeply wounded me, and I doubt I'll ever be able to erase those haunting images from my mind. Forgiveness seems impossible to me now. In my eyes, Maddie has committed the gravest betrayal of our marriage, and I can't see a way to recover from it. Now let me provide some context on how this affair unfolded. Maddie's corporate office is located in New York City, and she travels there a couple of times a year for work meetings. These meetings typically take place during the early part of the week, so her usual routine involves flying out on Sunday afternoon and returning on Tuesday evening. This pattern has been consistent throughout her tenure with the company. During her trips to NYC, Maddie always stays at one of the hotels within walking distance of. Her office was at one of these hotels where she met her younger lover, a man 15 years her junior who worked as a bartender. According to Sarah, the former girlfriend of Maddie's lover, they had an instant connection and spontaneously hooked up one night three years ago. Following that initial encounter, they continued their rendezvous annually for two more years until the affair ended last year. According to Sarah's account, Maddie's lover claimed that they were only together on five occasions, and all of these encounters took place on Sunday evenings in Maddie's hotel room. He insisted that they never shared a kiss and that he always used protection. However, I find it difficult to believe his claims. Sarah mentioned that she discovered the affair six months after it had ended when she stumbled upon explicit messages and pictures on his old smartphone. She confronted him, and he admitted to the affair, leading to Sarah kicking him out of her life. Unable to afford his own place in Manhattan, he had no choice but to quit his bartending job and move back to Long Island. I asked Sarah why she took so long to reach out to me. She explained that she hadn't initially planned to tell me, but her new boyfriend, who had experienced infidelity himself and strongly despises cheaters, convinced her to do so. He insisted that she had to inform me and that's why she finally did. I inquired if she knew why the affair had ended. According to her, Maddie eventually ended it because she confessed her love for me. It was a confusing revelation. After absorbing all this information, I took some time to grieve and figure out my next steps. After careful consideration, I've made the decision to divorce Maddie. Although I still have love for her, I can never trust her again and the image of her with that bartender will always haunt me. Furthermore, I've chosen not to confront her directly. Instead, I plan to catch her off guard by serving her with divorce papers. I don't want to give her the opportunity to explain herself or hear her excuses and apologies. I aim to make the day she receives those papers so emotionally charged that she'll feel worse than I did when I discovered her affair. It's my way of seeking revenge for her betrayal. In the meantime, I'll pretend everything is normal and act exceptionally kind. My own experience serves as proof that this kind of situation can happen to anyone. Even after 27 years of marriage, I never imagined I'd be one of those individuals sharing their personal stories with the world, but here I am. My parting advice for married men out there is never to become too complacent in your marriage and to stay vigilant at all times. Once the divorce papers are prepared, I intend to relocate my belongings to storage and arrange to have her served with the papers at her workplace. When she reaches out to me, I'll inform her that I've been aware of everything for weeks and provide evidence by sending her one of the explicit pictures that Sarah shared with me. Each time she attempts to contact me again, I'll send her another picture and another after that. Subsequently, I'll inform both our families about my decision to divorce her and the reasons behind it. At this moment, I am resolute in my choice and eagerly anticipate the day when I can disrupt her life just as she has disrupted mine. First update, darn it. Why is it that things never go as planned? 
the day arrived to serve Maddie, and everything seemed to be falling into place. I had all my belongings moved out in the morning, and in the afternoon, a courier delivered the divorce papers to her office. Serving Maddie as expected, she reacted strongly and immediately called me, to which I answered. I informed her that I knew all the details about her affair with the bartender, her boy toy, and that I had initiated divorce proceedings. She pleaded with me to allow her to explain, but I told her I had already moved out and advised her to consult an attorney. Then I ended the call. As I had anticipated, she started calling me repeatedly. In response, I sent her the first photo, and with each subsequent attempt to contact me, I forwarded another picture. At that moment, everything was unfolding just as I had planned. Later that evening, I phoned my son and shared the news with him. He was taken aback and understandably upset. He inquired if there was any chance of reconciling, to which I replied, no, not after what she did. I emphasized to him never to stay with a cheater. After our conversation, I was about to call my parents when my mom contacted me. She informed me that Maddie had just left their house, where she had been frantically searching for me. While at my parents' house, Maddie confessed everything to them and revealed that she had been undergoing counseling since ending the affair last year. She disclosed that she had been diagnosed with a sex addiction claiming that her infidelity was a result of this mental addiction that made it difficult for her to resist sexual temptation. Can you believe this afterward? I went to my parents' house to have a conversation with them. To my frustration, both of them attempted to dissuade me from divorcing Maddie. They weren't endorsing her actions, but they pointed out that it meant something significant that she had independently terminated the affair and sought treatment. My mom, in particular, was quite vocal about it and Dad also tried to soften my stance. I told them that a person should never remain in a relationship with a cheater, and I was taken aback and disappointed by their response. I expressed my view that labeling her actions as a result of addiction was merely an excuse for her infidelity. In my opinion, if you commit a wrongdoing, you must face the consequences. The ultimate consequence or penalty for marital infidelity is divorce, and that's the path I intend to take. Before leaving, my parents assured me that they would support whatever decision I made but requested that I take some time to reflect on it. I informed them that I had already done so and then left. After returning to the apartment I rented, I phoned Maddie's dad to let him know I was planning to visit and talk. He informed me that Maddie had just been there and had confessed everything, just as she had done with my parents. He expressed his disbelief in the whole addiction claim but suggested that I take some time before making a final decision. We continued our conversation, and while I didn't make any promises, I agreed to give it some thought. I have a close relationship with Maddie's parents, so going through with a divorce would also mean losing them, which would be emotionally challenging. That night, Maddie attempted to call me multiple times, but I chose not to answer. On Saturday morning, my son called and informed me that his mother had contacted him the previous night and confessed to everything. I have to give her credit for that, she has taken full responsibility for her actions and has come clean to our entire family. My son expressed his strong disapproval of his mother's actions and offered his full support to me. He mentioned that he knows I'll face pressure from his grandparents and assured me that he will stand by whatever decision I make. He also mentioned that if his current girlfriend ever did something similar to him, he would break up with her immediately. So that's the current state of affairs, I find myself in a temporary holding pattern, unsure of how to proceed. Although I'm eager to expedite the process of divorcing my wife, I'm also concerned about our families perceiving me negatively if I rush things. Second update I've gone through all your comments and want to express my gratitude for the advice, even if it's from those I might not fully agree with. I may not agree with what I want to clarify, but I'm still committed to pursuing the divorce. However, I've decided to meet with my soon-to-be ex to address some issues. I plan to allocate 60 minutes for her to speak her mind, and that's it. My attorney strongly advised against it, but if I proceed, the meeting will take place at his office and will be recorded. I proposed an alternative to meet at a neutral location with witnesses and record the discussion. My attorney agreed to this arrangement but cautioned me to exercise caution in my words and actions, as he's seen such meetings go awry for the betrayed spouse. 
I've scheduled the meeting for next Tuesday at her parents' house, where my son will accompany me and record the conversation using his tripod and gimbal. My son, along with my in-laws and my mom, will be in the adjacent room during the meeting. Unfortunately, my dad won't be able to attend due to a doctor's appointment at that time. My purpose for meeting with her is primarily to fulfill the expectations of my parents and in-laws. I'll provide an update here after my conversation with Maddie. Third update. We had the meeting, and it surprisingly went well, though it was emotionally taxing for me. I let her speak freely, with the only condition being that she not use her sex addiction as an excuse, which she agreed to. She started by declaring her love and longing for me, acknowledging that her actions were wrong, foolish, and meaningless. After her initial statements, she looked at me, and I responded with a simple okay and a look that seemed to ask, is that all? She continued by revealing that she had a moment of clarity last year after two years of the affair and had been in therapy since then. She confessed that she had hidden this from me out of fear of losing me. Maddie said therapy had been helpful, and her therapists believed she had worked through the underlying issues. I asked if her therapist saw this as a temporary solution, and she confirmed it was. I then inquired about how she would handle a similar situation if another young bartender came into the picture. She just looked at me. Tears for Mig in her eyes. I reminded her that time was running out, urging her to continue. She shifted the focus to my happiness during our marriage and asked if there was anything more she could have done for me. I acknowledged that I was content before the affair but noted there were fundamental areas she could have improved, such as trustworthiness and loyalty. Maddie insisted she had been loyal and loved only me. I gave her a doubtful look and laughed in her face. She tried to justify her actions, but it fell flat. She claimed she only cheated when away, so she never neglected me, and tried to argue that the lack of kissing and use of protection made a difference. It all seemed absurd, and she appeared to expect me to be impressed. I urged her to hear how ridiculous she sounded. She clarified she wasn't defending her actions, just explaining her thought process. I asked why she had done it if she was supposedly happy with our relationship. She admitted she was enticed by the idea of a young, attractive and being interested in her. Despite my efforts to make her feel beautiful, she thought she was no longer attractive. At this point, 45 minutes had passed, and I reminded her she had only 15 minutes left. She suggested that if given another chance, we could return to how things were before. I reiterated that it was impossible because I could never trust her again, and the mental image of her with her boy toy would haunt me. Desperate, she proposed a one-sided open relationship where I could be with anyone while she remained faithful. I quickly rejected this idea, emphasizing that I was not like her. This made her cry, and she spent the remaining time begging me to take her back. I let her cry and plead in silence. When the hour ended, I got up, took the gimbal with my son's phone attached, and left. Before departing, I had my son use Dropbox to send me the video, then I left. Later that evening, Maddie texted me thanking me for the meeting, but I chose not to. Reply Now that this task is done, my plan is to contact my attorney tomorrow morning to expedite the divorce proceedings. Final Update Our divorce was finalized last Wednesday. We split our assets equally, and Maddie decided to stay in the family home, buying out my share. She believes this decision might lead to a future reconciliation. The divorce process was emotionally and mentally exhausting. As time went on, I wavered in my determination and considered reconciling with Maddie, but I knew it would only lead to misery. Complicating things, the judge mandated 60 days of counseling for us before proceeding with the case. I questioned my attorney about the judge's authority to impose this, and he confirmed she had the power, advising me not to challenge it as it might work against me. So, I went through 16 counseling sessions, which I found painful and pointless. Maddie could have made things more difficult and expensive, but she chose not to, and I appreciated that. To show my gratitude, I took her out for dinner the day after our divorce and then went back to our house, for her now, for a nightcap. We became physically 
intimate for the first time in over a year, and it was a positive experience. You might wonder how this makes sense for me. It means I couldn't stay married to her after her infidelity, nor could I live with her again, but that doesn't mean I don't desire her physically. We both understand that our future relationship will focus on physical intimacy, somewhat like her connection with the bartender. She said she could accept this arrangement for now but wanted more and promised to keep trying. Although I haven't started dating other women yet, I plan to, and Maddie knows this. I told her that if one of these relationships becomes serious, I would end our physical relationship. She understood but didn't want to dwell on it, expressing her commitment to remain monogamous with me even if I find someone else. While I miss how things used to be, I appreciate our new arrangement. For the first time in a while, I feel positive about myself and the future.